Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to V2 uh, Institute for the Unstable Media and welcome to uh, Test Lab Topology. Um, my name is Michel van Dartel and together with Anne Nichte right here, uh, both of us working in the V2 lab, we will be uh, your host for this evening and take you through all these projects that you uh, see set up here. And we'll also uh, ask and, and moderate some, uh, some questions in between. Uh, but before uh, we start with the uh, formal program, I would like to give you a bit of a context to how we actually got to, uh, to organize uh, this edition of Tesla Lab on this topic. Um, because we have quite a mixed, uh, mixed crowd, as you, will, uh, as you will learn from this. Um, we knew uh, upon uh, setting up this edition of Tesla Lab that it would more or less coincide with, uh, with two other events. One being the uh, seminar at Pizzoir yesterday on the artistic practice of mapping, uh, where several artists were invited to give an overview of their, of their, uh, of their work. And the other event being uh, uh, the colloquium taking place right here um, today and tomorrow called, uh, as part of the project, a topological approach to cultural dynamics. And what the people in that colloquium are trying to do is to bring together all uh, different branches of science and arts that use uh, topology or, or use topological tools. And what we thought is that we could actually add to both of these, uh, these events by uh, using our test lab format that most of you uh, will probably know from previous editions where we invite uh, a few artists to present and demonstrate their work in a very hands-on way and invite you to, uh, to get involved and to give feedback on their work. Well, we thought by doing so uh, within this topic and in between these two events, uh, we would actually add to the seminar at Pete Swart uh, with, uh, with a couple of concrete examples of the work uh, uh, that was presented yesterday and also give the people in the colloquium or the participants in, in the colloquium that uh, debate this, this kind of stuff uh, tomorrow again, uh, some concrete um, examples to discuss in their, in their colloquium. Um, so with that in mind, we, we started to set up a, set up a theme and um, we, in our research for the theme, we found out that there's actually quite a lot of uh, different, different angles on the topic of topology. If you ask an artist uh, what topology is or a scientist or a mathematician, uh, you'll get quite diverse answers. And that doesn't necessarily have to mean that they're different things, but there is a lot of confusion in the area. And we decided to make use of, of, that, of, that, uh, of those various angles and uh, set up a couple of, uh, or invite a couple of artists to present their work and on the basis of that work try to get a better common understanding of what topology is. Um, and by doing, but with that in mind, we, uh, we set up the following program. Uh, first of all, we invited Tiziana Terranova, who is a professor at Napoli University, to give a brief introduction on the topic. Uh, she's an expert on art science relations and uh, cultural dynamics. And she's also one of the participants in that colloquium. So we thought if someone could explain to us uh, what topology or how topology works, both in the in the, uh, different branches of the arts and different branches of science, then uh, Tiziana uh, would definitely be able to to explain it to us. Uh, so she will lay down a sort of fundament for the evening, and then we'll go into uh, several uh, project presentations and demonstrations. The first being uh, Christoph Wachter and Matthias Judd. Uh, who have this setup that you see here on the, on the left. And uh, what they are doing is a, is a, a project they actually started in 2000. And uh, what their aim is in that is fill up the gaps uh, or the censored areas in Google Maps. And they don't do that by themselves. They, they created a platform where uh, any, anyone with an internet connection can actually contribute to that uh, filling up of these, of these, uh, these gray areas. Uh, they'll explain uh, their project in, in, in greater detail. Um, but after the, the presentation of their work and demonstration, because they will also invite you to, to get involved in this filling up of these great areas, then we'll move to uh, Yolanda Harris's work, who has brought uh, two devices, as she calls satellite sounders, uh, which pick up um, the uh, satellite signals that are always around you, but you're never actually aware of. And, uh, they pick it up and translate it into audio, and in that sense also make something invisible visible, just like the, uh, the project uh, Zone into Deep. Um, then it's, uh, it's, uh, it's time to welcome Bureau d'Etudes uh, to the stage, who have a, a, a background, uh, actually a quite extensive CV in, in uh, 
artistic mapping. And yesterday they got described as um, cartographers, uh, activist cartographers, and I think that's, that's actually a label that, that suits them very well. And uh, they will not talk about, they will not give an overview of their work here. We, uh, they did that yesterday in the Beats Watch seminar, but what they'll do today here is get you involved in, a map, in the mapping. So you will all get a sheet of paper and you can start drawing your own, uh, your own map. So that's gonna be very exciting and fun as well. Then at the end of the evening, we thought it, it would be nice to, to throw in something completely different. And this is the, the, what we call the fashion intervention. And this is a, a project by Di Mainstone, who is currently artist in residence at V2, and who is working on a project that, um, that is on wearable technology in the, in the fashion aesthetic. Um, basically, this consists of uh, uh, garments that are interchangeable and, and reconfigurable. And you as an audience are also invited after this to, to um, uh, interact with these with these garments, and uh, she will she will present the current state of this work, um, and then afterwards you're all invited to to hang around, have a few drinks, and and keep interacting with all these with all these great installations. Okay, uh, without further ado, I would like to welcome Tiziana to to the stage for her presentation. Okay, I want to thank Michelle and the V2 Institute for inviting me to give this paper. And I feel I, st I stand here as a representative somehow of this uh, uh, project that um, a, a, quite a group of people are present here today are involved in, which is a, a cultural approach, um, uh, a topological approach to cultural dynamics. And we've been uh, meeting, we met actually once before in Amsterdam and we met again today and it's quite a, heterogeneous group of people, you know, we're talking about physicists, social scientists, uh, architects. Uh, so it's, we're really starting to come to grips uh, with uh, what it is that we mean by topology and why it is that it's interesting to us in terms of thinking about all the different issues, you know, from design to social research to cultural politics and so on. And my perspective, more than summarizing what topology is in all these different fields, I feel that I, I'm going to give you more perspective of why uh, it was that at some point while researching the internet uh, or what now is called network culture, at some point um, I felt that um, going back to what space meant or what understanding of space was involved in computer networks and the cultures that went with it, uh, you know, why, why was it? I quite liked it. Um. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I like that sound. Uh, why, why is it that at some point you, you, you needed to start, at least to start using this word topology that seemed to have uh, some implications uh, uh, that were more interesting in terms of developing um, and new ways of thinking, experimenting, doing things with the internet. So where, where we started uh, in the mid-1990s uh, was more or less with this kind of representations of what uh, an informatic space, an informational space was about. As you might remember, uh, around that time, all the talk was about cyberspace. And cyberspace, uh, from the first uh, uh, publications, such as uh, Michael Benedict, Cyberspace First Steps, you know, from the very cover, was represented as this uh, uh, three-dimensional kind of three grid, uh, where um, it was a kind of virtual reality type of representation, and it looked like a, a space that uh, was an alternative to the real world, a space which represented this, it as a 3D construct uh, where disembodied actors uh, uh, could move. And that kind of understanding um, uh, was translated at some point by sociologists uh, and uh, people from cultural studies working on the internet, uh, who also seemed to uh, um, agree and kind of uh, put forward this idea that uh, this was not a real space, uh, that it was a geometric space, uh, it was a kind of geometric space uh, which uh, took away all the accidents and all the, the, the brutality of real life and you know, transposed you somewhere else where all that could be left behind. Lately, when I watched uh, this really cheap film, which is called Jumper, I don't know, Jumpers, I don't know if you've seen it, that reminded me of that, you know, this idea that this computer network was all about jumping from one side of the planet uh, in the half a second it took to click, 
uh, a link and there was no real transformation involved in this passage uh, uh, through this planetary space on networks. So it seemed that uh, this representation was not, or space, this approach to space really did not make justice to what computer networks were becoming and there was another way of looking at it. So this is where uh, topology came in. And uh, obviously there are many different uh, uh, understandings of, of uh, topology, but Manuel de Landa is one who has pretty much worked out in extensive details what he thinks uh, uh, topology means from a philosophical point of view and how he can help uh, to think space again uh, in, in ways uh, that uh, uh, present a break with uh, current sociological thinking about space, or what he thinks is current sociological thinking about space. And this is what he defines, uh, how he describes topology, saying that uh, he concerns the properties of geometric figures, which remain invariant, underbending, stretching or deforming uh, transformations, or at least transformations which do not create new points or fuse existing ones. So topology involves uh, homeo homeomorphisms, uh, which convert nearby points into nearby points, which can be reversed or continuously undone. And under these transformations, many figures which used to be distinct in Euclidean geometry or three-dimensional space can become one and the same uh, figure. So he thinks that topology comes um, uh, together in, um, as a kind of uh, is part of uh, uh, a rethinking of, uh, uh, of Euclidean geometry, which starts in the 19th century, and uh, is one of several non-Euclidean geometry um, uh, states, uh, which um, allows for this kind of space uh, that uh, this meshwork of communication networks uh, has become uh, to be thought in a different way. It's a space of potentials rather than, rather than a space of pre-given and harmless uh, possibilities. So it's something that he thinks can give us new ways uh, to think about it. So it's not a metric space because we can't measure it. And uh, uh, topological understanding, uh, topological geometry uh, believes that the metric space which we inhabit and that the physicists study and measure is born from something that lies beneath it, which subtends, which is a non-metric uh, continuum, what he calls a, a non-metric topological continuum. And that this geometric space, this uh, apparent three-dimensional space, is the result of a differentiation of this uh, basic continuum, uh, which is uh, the underlying structure of, uh, of space. So I'll go into details, uh, into, um, more into details about that drawing on the land. Mm. Okay, so this is a, a, a quotation uh, from uh, Delanda again. Starting from Gauss uh, in the 19th century, at the end of the 18th century, what happens, according to Delanda, that geometry finds out that you can not, these figures, the geometric figures that you could draw, like triangles and circles and squares, that looked like they were just uh, uh, inscribed in a, on a surface that had no meaning in itself, uh, was not quite right. That uh, this space could be, these figures could be described without any reference uh, to the space in which they were embedded. And uh, that you could not treat uh, the surface on which you could draw a triangle, or which triangles got drawn, or other geometrical figures were drawn, as something that did not have any properties the surface which supported uh, or which made visible this geometrical figure was in a surface in itself, was a space in itself, uh, had its own dynamics. It could not be considered just a blank sheet on which we uh, draw something. So it gave uh, surface uh, a materiality. These geometries then uh, have allowed a conception of space uh, that is different, both from the Euclidean geometry, where you have triangles and all this kind of shape, but also from phenomenological approaches to space, uh, getting out of a kind of double bind. So on the one hand, when the surface on which you inscribe, draw a triangle or another Euclidean figure uh, can no longer be thought as the simple support for it, uh, but it becomes a surface with its own properties, which is embedded in a non-totalizable dynamic continuum. 
This means that the images that we're used to see on computer networks uh, with their static nodes and links uh, do not give us the space of a network. But they also imply that a kind of freezing, a kind of themselves, they're a kind of freezing of this underlying movement of connecting and disconnecting, you know, from all sides of the planet, of information flowing through the networks. They give of it only a frozen representation. On the other hand, the space of the network, which cannot be simply represented uh, through these figures uh, because they just freeze it, cannot be said to be the product of human consciousness either. A network space is not simply what uh, the user perceives it, perceives it to be. It has concrete properties that often escape human consciousness, or which we can be made conscious all of only after some kind of labor or cognitive uh, uh, estrangement, you know, getting rid of this sensation that it's all about clicking on links and getting on different places. The space underneath uh, has its own uh, uh, properties. Thus, according to this approach, There is no totality which organizes the network space as an extrinsically defined unity. And network space has its own ontological reality, its own local properties, its own unconscious, which is not defined exclusively by the way we perceive it. The second uh, feature of this topological space is that uh, uh, it is a continuum, so it stretches uh, through the whole space of the network, but it's uh, a multidimensional one and its dimensions exceed the three dimensions that Euclidean geometry attributes to it. And time cannot even be considered the fourth dimension, but is itself a nonlinear property of space. Even if it is no longer embedded in a global space which gives it unity, a network does not become a disembodied, free-floating, amorphous entity. On the contrary, the space of embeddedness is multiplied. According to Riemann, um, a topological space is constituted not just by the actual uh, uh, trajectory, the actual mechanical trajectory that an object uh, can, uh, can perform, but the all the space uh, is defined by all the possibilities for change that the object has. There are many dimensions to a space which define all the possibilities for its uh, transformations. The successive uh, dimensions are not simply analogous to the three dimensions that we experience, but define a field of potentials. For every concrete network, for every concrete actualization of network topologies, there are always a number of dimensions which supplement it, and which can at any time be actualized by an action, a change of direction, and a transformation. A network space is intensive and dynamic. It is defined by the way it can change, its potentials, its degrees of freedom. Third, this multidimensional abstract space is not uniform, but even as it is a continuum, but it's characterized by what Henri Poincaré defined as singularities, that is, special points or attractors which determine the long-term tendencies of a topological space considered as a dynamic system. Singularities are like tendencies of uh, a topological space. They are implicit form, forms which are topological rather than geometric. That is, forms which determine the unfolding of a process, but which can yield wildly different results. Thus far, you know, I might be wrong, but this is my hypothesis. Uh, I think the network science uh, has uh, discovered at least one of these singularities, uh, the power laws. The power law, in fact, can be, uh, much better, uh, can be much better described as a singularity rather than a law in a deterministic sense. It's a tendency of networks, it's a tendency of a distributed network space. Given a network uh, which has a random distribution, uh, once this network is used a number of times, once it is subjected to the recursive action of the users, it tends to assume the form of a power law, which means uh, a few nodes get most of the links, and most of the other nodes get to, uh, tend to get uh, very few links or very few accesses in a kind of infinite uh, tails. So this is one of the, the kind of, this network space that look like this. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> right, it will be the third one. When it's actually used over a number of uh, uh, times, it tends to assume this, this form. It tends to create a super hubs which absorb most of, the, most of the traffic. 
So this is a tendency inherent in network space. However, topological thinking teaches us that such a singularity, this tendency, does not need to be realized in all cases, and there is always the possibility of new spaces of freedom, of new actualization, nested even inside the long tail. The unfolding of a topological space of multiplicity is always divergent. This is because the process of morphogenesis, the production of forms in a topological space, takes place through what the Landa defines as symmetry-breaking cascades of bifurcations, a singularity, or sets of singularities, that is, the special points or attractors which define the tendencies of a system are not stable. As the Landa put it, singularities can undergo symmetry-breaking transitions that can be converted into another one. In simulations of topological processes, the symmetry-breaking transitions can be provoked by changing the control parameters, that is, by modulating the strength of external shocks or perturbations to which the system may be subject. And these control parameters tend to display critical values or thresholds of intensity at which a particular bifurcation takes place, breaking the prior symmetry of the system. So the tendencies of a network defined by its singularities are, in their turn, thus networked, but the network is unstable. The links are no longer lines which connect point A to point B. But, at the level of tendencies, the linkages define the bifurcations and the transitions that the overall space is potentially subjected to. The distance between any two points on a topological surface can never be defined by an exact length, but they are always potentially in a relationship of virtual proximity. Fourth, topological spaces are meshed. Unlike essence, essences, uh, concrete universals, which is what he called, uh, to calls topological spaces, are meshed together into a continuum. This further blurs the identities of multiplicities, creating zones of indiscernibility where they blend into each other, forming a continuous immanent space. I was interested in this last um, issue because beyond, and I'm, I'm going to just um, uh, close with this, as I said, what, what is interesting about this is this conceptualization of uh, network space as something that is subject to change, to potential, to transformation. And every time a, 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 a site is accessed, every time a link is used, you induce a transformation in the overall quality of the space, which is not just random, but which tends to produce certain patterns, which tends to produce certain forms, such as super hubs, power laws, and so on. My next question is, having, uh, and I'm talking from the perspective of uh, the research project I've been involved in uh, in a while, which is uh, uh, the Iraqi war and the whole uh, uh, blogosphere, the whole communication of information about the blogosphere, about the, the Iraqi war in the internet. And you can see definitely in the space of uh, uh, the, the, the blogosphere, the blogs related to Iraq, the formation of super hubs, the formation of a power law which is the tendencies of people who want to access information about Iraq to go to the same sites and form a kind of critical mass around some of these uh, sites. At the same time, you can also see other processes going on, such as uh, point on, on very different uh, parts of the planet, from South Africa to the United States, uh, to Saudi Arabia, uh, to Egypt, to, to converge on this, uh, on this blog, so to create a kind of, uh, I don't know whether it can be described as a topological figure, but a kind of condensed uh, hyper global hyperspace of people who are interested in the Iraqi war and want to talk about it. And the other question I, I, I also asked myself is, um, how does this topology of the um, Iraq blogosphere is connected to the actual topology of Iraq as such, you know, and the way space has been uh, transformed by this uh, uh, singularity or this, uh, this uh, attractor, which is the Israel, Israel, I don't know how to pronounce this, Israelization <laughs> of Iraq, Palestinization, I don't know, the way in which uh, uh, certain uh, strategies of occupation, of breaking down of the territory, of uh, uh, partitioning, of creating zones, uh, you know, is being applied in Iraq. So how does this uh, con topological continuum, which is the network, the internet, and all the information that circulates around Iraq, which gives form to all kinds of figures and experiences of Iraq, connects to the ways in which the actual uh, space of Iraq is being transformed by another singularity, as we would call it, which is that of partitioning, uh, mobile borders, uh, modulation of control, and so on. 
So I hope that was not too obscure <laughs> because we are moving from a kind of context uh, uh, with, that, uh, with the um, colloquium today where we're getting quite deep into this uh, topology matters <laughs> to one where maybe, you know, I don't know what level of uh, uh, involvement there is with this, with this kind of issues, but I will be happy to take questions at the end if uh, it was a bit too obscure, as I'm afraid it might have been. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Is there somebody from uh, the audience who has a question uh, oh, on that? We're going to wait at the end. We're going to take mm, uh, just two quick questions while you're totally into the subject. Later on, you have plenty of time to, uh, to talk uh, and chat uh, together, but I think it's quite nice to take the momentum for some Good. questions from the audience. Good. Yeah, there's one. That was over. Oh, okay. Um, then I'll try to uh, come up with a question uh, I just uh, thought about. It occurred to me that uh, topology today resembles rather a study of languages um, than a study of mathematics. Uh, the quantity of theorems is huge. And the, all these uh, theorems with uh, all its variations are showing a huge, huge contrast, for example, with uh, the reductive approach in uh, what we quite often see in technical science and engineering. And I was wondering if you um, think it uh, could uh, be one of the reasons, this kind of fakeness or openness about topology, that that is one of the reasons why a lot of different disciplines are so interested in that. Can, can you tell us a little bit uh, about that? Maybe I can, I can talk about uh, a bit about the discussions we've been having in the, in the, in the work groups uh, and okay. uh, during the lectures today which have basically resolved, uh, revolved around um, the issue whether topology is a metaphor to talk yeah, about yeah. space, so whether it's a metaphor to talk about the network as this kind of continuum uh, which is continuously formed and deformed by use, you know, which every, every action in the ne network creates a deformation of the space and we're just finding topology useful because it gives us the language to talk about it, or the other approach, which is topology is a model and is the, the, the kind of uh, scientific engineering approach. So you can model a topological system, you can model uh, a section and network in such a way that you just give it a few rules and the network will behave topologically, it will show features of a topological space. Mm -hmm. Myself, uh, I tend to think of it uh, as, a, as a model rather than a metaphor. And I'm saying that because you know, we discussed that um, in the work groups again. As a model, it doesn't need to be, we don't need to, to think about it as I'm just a model for control, you know, which serves uh, preemptive and predictive purposes. If you can think about a network space uh, as a space which is populated by singularities, which is uh, attractors, uh, tendencies, you know, which we know through modeling, through empirical studies of the, of the internet, the space can take, then maybe we can play with them as well. You know, okay. we, we can play with them in a kind of, again, artistic, cultural, uh, social way, not in a lab uh, with a computer. You know, we can try to see if there really are attractors in a network that tend to make it behave in such a way, whether we can push it out of control by, you know, by shocking it in some way, which is, I think, what, for example, virus writers have been doing. Okay. That they found, yeah. uh, you know, that, some, that there's a tendency in the network to create accidents and disorders and bugs, and they started playing with it. So, I don't know. No, that's, that's actually quite a beautiful bridge to, uh, to the presentations we'll uh, see uh, later on tonight in the demonstrations, because I think the topological modeling uh, will be uh, present or abused or interpreted by uh, various projects as well as uh, the the whole metaphor or misinterpretation. So I would like to invite you all to move to the next project. Um, Which is here. 
it's there. Oh, and for those who are, who are not familiar with the test lab, uh, it's a kind of dynamic uh, event. So this was uh, your bit of seating in a, a kind of college uh, setup. Now you have to move. I think the, so best, please place, move. <laughs> the best place for, for all of you actually would also be here. This whole area is free and this is where the, actions, uh, where the action will be happening. So uh, in the meantime, I'll, uh, I'll again introduce uh, Christoph Warta and Matthias Jurt. They're both uh, Berlin-based media artists. And uh, as I said, they started this platform already in 2000, and which is also why they can now show you uh, the results of uh, having this platform running for quite, quite a few years already. So if you want to take it over from here. Yes, thank you. Well... Um, we might be citizens, soldiers, patriots, but from a certain factor of power, we are excluded. It is not allowed to enter military restricted areas. And it's not allowed to take pictures or draw maps. The world as an open space to discover and to explore is a wrong idea. The world is in part restricted, forbidden, and disguised. This restriction is based on the law. In contradiction to this restriction, we are, feed, we are fed with propaganda material, information published for recruitment, to encourage patriotism, to demonstrate military power or national strength, and so on. The gap between these existing pictures and the restriction is the initial question that Zona Edit explores. We began the project Zona Edit, French for Military Restricted Era, in the year 2000. We collected all the materials from the military er eras. First, we collected articles from newspapers in a slip box and worked in traditional forms with drawings and paintings. Then we started a collection on the internet. Here we do see this uh, connection. Uh, it is an interactive map, so we can zoom in. Every green dot represents a military and restricted area. Um, so let's go a bit closer. To the Netherlands here, we do have a the U.S. Army area in the Netherlands. Um, we can open it, and every base has its own um, identity sheet. On this identity sheet, there are kind of informations. There are some links where we do see how it looks like and uh, how it got uh, public. And there is also the possibility to edit all this stuff. So it's kind of a wiki syntax. It is not restricted, so the whole thing can be edited by everybody, and it's just a security code that has to be entered. It is also all georeferenced that, ha that we can watch this. So this is multi-map. This was the first map uh, that was worldwide accessible long before Google. And um, on this map, maybe we zoom in a bit. that it's not here, <laughs> and, and yeah, here it is. So we can see it on different tools, how it appears, and there are also um, um, possibilities to search yourself, so there are pre-configured searches. We can search in Wikipedia for this Shinnen, and then it appears already this page that is here. So there are more or less 2,500 points and everybody can add its own finding quite easily here. Well, a year after beginning this project, 
9-11 happened. Followed by the war in Afghanistan, Guantanamo, the Iraq invasion. This gave the project an unforeseen explosiveness. The world map changed. The wording changed and our perception. Guantanamo became one of the most discussed military eras. So, oops. Okay. So. <laughs> yeah, we um, began also to collect uh, all the findings uh, for Guantanamo and we um, put them on this interactive map here. So we can go to a place. We do see here the whole Camp Delta. And yeah, for example, the prison ward. Um, we do not have own material, so all um, things we have are references to sites that are public. And um, there are some rules. We are not allowed to enter material that we have to buy or material where you do have to do a login. So um, what we do have here are screenshots from sites and yeah, that's how it looks like. This is from the Defense Department, the US Defense Department, this side. Well, to put the findings and the pictures in a relation and to gain an impression about the dimensions of the places, we tried also a virtual 3D walkthrough. Specific images can be brought together, information can be completed, and we can gain complex impressions of some of the restricted errors, and we can concentrate them in a 3D walkthrough. Neither as a construction nor as a reconstruction, but rather a temporary approximation as a fading of blind spots. Yeah, we put it all together to 3D walkthrough that you can freely downloadable from the web. We did it here on this computer already and started it up. So um, you can move through this thing with a joystick or with your um, arrow keys. And um, yeah, what we do have here is uh, um, also a georeferencing. So we do always see while moving where we are. We do have the possibility to communicate with other people that are using um, another zone entity uh, walkthrough. So, hello there. Okay, that's how it works. We do also have um, a map where we do have an overview. We have here where we are and uh, in which direction we look. We have here all these green dots that are dots that have more information um, to it. So we can go to such a dot. We can then directly access it and jump there. So here we are. We see our position here down on the map. We can enter. This is a, such a 48 detention block we saw, we saw before. And we do have here um, also always the picture of the sources they are from. We do have here above a kind of a radar where we do always see where we are. And if we access such a source, it goes back to the internet, so to the tool we saw before. And yeah, the question is now what's the, what's the different why to do such a 3D walkthrough if there are just um, sources that can be accessed like that. Um, we see here a picture also from the defense department and uh, we see uh, such a cell. It is uh, tied up. It is, uh, yeah, you are warmly welcome. It's already, everything is uh, prepared. And um, the thing is that we are manipulated by these pictures. So there is a towel behind the fence here for that we do not see the, the whole structure. So we do not have an impression of about how it looks like. And just by collecting all these pictures and puzzling them together, uh, you can really gain an idea of, um, uh, or a bigger picture of the place there. Why, why can we be manipulated by propaganda? 
especially military pictures, requires our confession, con concession, friend or foe, right or wrong. It seems that we have a choice. Even when we criticize, we are part of the system, right or wrong, true or false. We just flip the sides. I can't influence the power beyond military pictures. Even not for politicians remain this power untouchable. A part of my own horizon of imagination belongs, therefore, to a small conspirative group of militaries. Our agreement and, our, and the acceptance of military secrecy is based on our identity. This, is concept, this concept creates fundamental identification as a collective national feeling. Our government takes responsibility for different aspects of our life. Ex examples are health care, social system, education, guarantees security and prosperity. The complex governmentality promises security. And when we had to take responsibility for our own security, we start to deal with questions of military security and lose the concession of total security. Maybe we would live in fear. Our acceptance and blind trust is also an explanation for a well-known phenomenon. Ich habe davon nichts gewusst, ist in German. I didn't know anything about it. With the principles of art production, we question the pictures and our imagination in a complex act of, in a complex act of seeing and creating. We can gain a new, a new sight or a new perception. This can change everything, not just the understanding and the sight of the world, even the idea and the understanding of myself and my own identity. So we'd like to take a look at Camp Buka now. Here are some pictures. Yeah, we do see here um, the Space Needle. We have also a, a map here on the internet. Um, so Camp Buka is very interesting this. because it's uh, the sister uh, prison of uh, Abu Ghraib. It's in Iraq. Yeah, and um, what's quite interesting about that is um, that is clearly visible from the sky because you have this huge space needle. And uh, when we go in to Google satellite images, for example, now, yeah, we do see the space needle, but uh, there is nothing else around and so, so we, we, we talk about sorry we talk about the prison for um, more than fifth, five thousand prisoners so it's a huge it's uh, one of the hugest prisons and it is the sister prison of Abu Ghraib okay. and um, well when Abu Ghraib happened in the um, it, it was all censored afterwards so um, and what we can see here if we move a bit around is, yeah, that there was once a picture and so that there is something, you know, behind that. Just the question is what? And so we see, we see here this, this corner and this corner is evidence for something has been here before and this was this uh, picture from this prison, so now it's uh, deleted there. Well, this uh, example for um, censorship on, on Google, so... Um, it is, it is um, just uh, this, um, all these contents, they um, are censored in a, in a moment when they get uh, really... Um, you know, when there was a problem. So there was not a problem that they have been attacked there, but there was a problem that Abu Ghraib happened and uh, yeah. the prison should be deleted, most probably. So, well, uh, um, these are examples what we can uh, search and what we need our, what, what we need your help because our um, Dutch is not, um, is nothing. We, we can't search in Dutch, so it's, it's not helpful. And uh, for, for um, Camp Holland, for example, or this is called Camp um, Hadrian, and those are uh, camps uh, in Afghanistan. It's, it's needed to, to search in Dutch. It's much better. It will be much faster and bring more results. But um, at least a, a, a quick uh, preview of what we can see afterwards. Um, here in, in 
um, Bagram on Bagram Air Base, uh, a Dutch soldier, and we have uh, revealed there a, a secret prison, a very notorious prison, was then in the news in Switzerland and so on. Um, well, uh, we could we could take quickly a look at this prison also and at this huge air base, and probably you can help us to f uh, find here new news details in this space. So this is uh, the prison we uncovered. It's uh, in an old um, building from the Russians, and so it was already visible on the satellite pictures before because the Americans published it when it was in the ownership of the Russians. And uh, what is quite interesting uh, here is that uh, most people that are nowadays in Guantanamo have been um, transported through this prison here. There was a, a lot of uh, discussion of uh, prisoner abuse. And um, it is to see in this walkthrough of uh, Son Andredit. And uh, what we see here now on the screen is another um, building next to the prison. We do not know what it is for, but it is not uh, on the satellite image yet. So um, I think afterwards, in uh, it's called Playtime by Michelle, <laughs> <laughs> there will be an open joystick, and uh, yeah, everybody we have a lot can access uh, can access this material and uh, material walk, here. Walk a bit around. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think. You can give them an applause for their presentation. <laughs> I'm, I'm really amazed to see your database uh, so huge already, because I think to most of these people, it's, it's even hard to understand that all of this material is actually, like all of the sensor material is, is classified, and you do this purely on the basis of some uh, publicly accessible uh, accidental shots basically right am i right yes um, yeah that's as a, that's also um, kind of a rule of our project because we um, are not spies we are not interested in things that we can't see but we are interested in things we can see mm -hmm. and if you access this uh, or if you face this problem of uh, i didn't do anything about it then it's the question what can we see and we have not traveled to any of these places so we, we really never went there. We sat at home in front of the computer, in front of the TV, and we, we, we just watched it and uh, tried to figure out what, what can we know, what's really the possibility. And another problem that we are facing there is um, that we, as the people, are sovereign in a state, so we have to decide about things we are not allowed to see, and that's a, a problem. We, we have to deal with it somehow. Mm. And. Uh, uh, just a quick question uh, before I hand over the microphone to the audience. Uh, what is the response so far from the official uh, bodies in, in, in this, like uh, military organs? Do they approach you on this uh, at all? Of course, not at all, because a, a good military and strategy, um, strategist always says, well, we expected such things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, that's smart. Uh, anyone else uh, has a question for Kistel? No? No one else? Okay. Well, uh, you're already invited to, to uh, join the project later on or play around and ha do these walk arounds, but also, uh, of course, visit the website and, and add, uh, add content to it, especially regarding the, the Dutch uh, yes, uh, military <laughs> Um I think then, uh, then we just continue to uh, Yolanda Harris right here, and Anna will take over. Here next to me is a composer and media artist working with sound, image um, and space in a technological extended environment. She uses uh, technology in her work as the means through which we understand the electronically extended spaces we inhibit. Her work that will be dem demonstrated tonight, Sun Run Sun, deals with navigation in public space with all its assets as a as body topologies. It uses topological modeling to generate sonic landscapes, and Yolanda will first 
give a short introduction uh, to the work and after that you are invited to subscribe yourself here at the table to take a little tour here in the area, 10 minutes uh, tour to experience the piece yourself. Uh, so Yolanda, maybe you can tell a little bit about it. Okay. <clears throat> I hope my microphone's, yes, good. Uh, well, this project um, has been presented over the last month in a number of different um, instances with different descriptions of what it might be. So tonight it's about topology. So uh, I'm not going to talk about topology specifically. I leave it to you to make the, make the links that you find of interest. Um, it's about these little satellite sounders that are sitting here. I don't know if you can see them. I'll hold them up. This is one. So, just quickly, this is, a, this is the computer, this is the GPS antenna, and this is the battery pack linked to the headphones. So, in the last uh, four or five months, I uh, have developed uh, this piece through a residency in the Netherlands Media Art Institute in Amsterdam. Um, it's part of a longer research of about two years into navigation technologies and landscape and sound and the relation between them. I've been particularly interested in um, navigation at sea, if most navigation really takes place and has, the, the technologies of navigation have been developed historically specifically at sea because that's the, the place you get most lost. Um, so I, uh, um, I have been working with um, GPS, but also with uh, celestial navigation. So I, I learned how to navigate using a sextant, for example, um, which was really very interesting because it showed to me how uh, a, num a number of things. If you take celestial navigation, which, which involves observation of the environment, you're looking at the sun moving around the earth, the sun, the moon, the stars, and you're relating it visually through this, through this instrument called the sextant. You're pulling down the sun to line it up on the horizon. So this, and you're taking the exact time that you do this. And this kind of uh, very manual and uh, skillful thing that you have to practice and you have to repeat every day. Um, and it's really um, visual. You're really tied to looking, the act of looking. Uh, I was, I was very interested how GPS completely um, uh, negates maybe that whole relation to an environment. Um, the experience of the GPS is that the, the precision for navigation is it, you have a, a connection to satellites that comes in once a second, for example. So once a second, you know exactly where you are. That's not the same as with the celestial navigation, which you might know roughly where you are every few hours of the day, or once a day, or once every three days, and you have to um, infer where you are by your calcul calculations and your movement through a space. So, in actual fact, once I started looking into it, how, how does the GPS work in terms of finding out your longitude and latitude? Um, really because I think people uh, are starting to use it as a, as, take it as kind of a, a blind guidance, if you like, um, not questioning where you are at all. You, you're told where you are, so that is your idea of location now, okay? So that, this is what I'm, I'm, I'm interested in playing with, with these, these little instruments here. So looking into it, I found that the data comes into the, that comes into the GPS receiver is much more than just your longitude and latitude on a grid. Okay, it it takes, uh, and there's, there are, there are uh, there's quite a lot of data. But the data that I was interested in was something that showed the process of navigation of locate, locating yourself. So, if there are 32 satellites in the GPS system you might be able to see, uh, uh, get a signal from eight, maybe maximum 12 at a time. Um, those, those satellites are all in a particular position in the sky. So they, are, they, they have their, their, uh, 
their identification number, their elevation, which is within 90 degrees, that's that number, you have 0 to 90, their azimuth, which is 0 to 360, and their signal strength, or signal to noise ratio. And this is kind of, if you learn celestial navigation, this is totally basic stuff, right? This is nothing, nothing this is no rocket science, right? But these numbers change all the time. Um, what I've done it, by, by playing with the sound that these numbers are coming in, turning them directly into sounds, and um, I've taken six, the six strongest satellites. So as, as one loses its signal strength and drops out, it's replaced by another one. So what you're listening to whilst walking around is not actually your location in terms of latitude and longitude, but uh, these moving satellites overhead. Um, that to me <laughs> is uh, almost all I need to say, I think, about this. I wanted to play some sound examples because the, the, the main thing, once you've got this, these, uh, this data that's coming in once a second and you can build up quite, a, quite an amount of data, how do I turn that into sound and what kind of decisions do I make about which sounds I use? Um, it's very simple data, really. I was restricted by a number of a number of things. One is this this little little computer here called the Gumsticks, which V2 have been using in their lab as well. This little thing, which runs Linux and um, uh, and PD, which are PDA, which I'm running on there. So. That only that has a very limited amount of processing power and can only run a certain number of oscillators and phases before it gives up. So that's really what I was limited to uh, in developing the sounds. Um, I'm a composer by training, so that was quite a challenge, really. Um, I'm going to play you. <clears throat> I, another important thing is you won't hear anything in here because um, there's no connection. It, you can't get any signal inside the space. So what I'm going to play you is pre-recorded files, basically, um, and examples of different mappings, different choices I've made to turn that data into sound. Just to give you an idea of the variety, basically, that you can have. And if any of you are interested in seeing the, 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 mm, the programming, the software side of it, um, it's all open source and the, the, the GPS parser is available so you can have a look if anybody's interested. You can hear that they're very simple sounds, but the combinations of them and the behaviors, um, I decided not to make a continuous sound. I, I take the, the data when it changes. So every time it changes, it starts to describe an envelope of a sound rather than making a continuous. So you can hear them coming in and out of a phase, if you like. Sometimes it's quite silent. That's, don't, I mean, when you walk out with them, don't think that because it's silent, nothing's happening.
different one, for example. And um, just finally, the, uh, as you walk, you will hear the sounds of the environment. So you'll hopefully hear the car coming before you jump out in front of it. Okay. Um, seriously, I did actually get somebody say, I nearly got knocked over by a car and blamed me for it. So don't, don't uh, do that, please. Um, that's part of the part of the research and part of the project is um, the how it changes your perception of the space that you're moving through. So it's it's, a, it's kind of a hybrid of the two the two layers of spaces: electronic sound mesh and the and the uh, environment. This is a little example of um, amphibians combined frogs. <laughs> combined with the sounds. So I was quite happy to find that these very limited sounds are actually something that's reflected in, in sounds, uh, sounds in the natural world and in the environment as well. So that's um, part, something to pay attention to when you go walking, because I hope you do go out and use these things. Um, there are a couple of points to make that uh, this, there, there is no signal in here, so you're going to have to go out to a, an open part of the of an open enough space to get a good signal. When it's confined uh, with buildings, a confined street, it's, it's not very good. Huh? So be patient and try uh, to walk, you know, out, out here. What is it? Left, right, over to the, the green part and the park. And uh, you'll start, I mean, I set them up today and they were working beautifully. So it's a bit of patience. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, please, um, for all of you, if you uh, want to subscribe, uh, my colleague there with the white paper is there to help you. There's only two sets uh, available. Perhaps so three. Uh, secretly uh, three, secretly. if it's really busy. Yeah. Um, and um, as uh, Dai already indicated, it's actually recommended to take a little walk towards the NIE uh, building, uh, Boymans van Beuningen. There in that area, it's quite nice and open to experience the sound. And you may really like it, but we ask you not to take too long walks and not to get lost, because otherwise we have a 
problem with little Q here. Then we, we have to enjoy it. I mean, yeah, you have you to know, enjoy it. So yeah, you that's, get that's lost, a better. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, you won't get lost. <laughs> it's easy. So uh, from Some here, we, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we move to the next presentation and feel free to also wander around and start to test uh, and check with uh, the other projects in the meantime. Uh, Michel is going to lead you to our next uh, project over there. Yeah, I'm going to lead you back to where you were at the start, basically. <laughs> so this is where the, where the next event will take place. and. Uh, <coughs> This is basically a, a mapping exercise for yourself, uh, hosted by Bureau d'Etudes from uh, Paris, an artist duo from Paris. Um, and um, they will have a few uh, assignments for you to, uh, to do. Um, and for these assignments, it would be wise if each of you could take two of these yellow notes in the, in the buckets and take... Oh, take three, <laughs> and um, and a couple of these color colorful pencils, and uh, what we're going to do with it will be clear in a, in a little bit. Ok, euh, bien. Ok, it's the first time we uh, we propose uh, this uh, this experiment, and we don't know if uh, it's work. Uh, also, the, the English perhaps is not so <laughs> good. <laughs> Okay, uh, the point is uh, we are not sure if uh, we know where we are with uh, GPS. And uh, the first question is um, how many uh, am I and uh, you are? You have a small paper and you must uh, write a number how many you, you think you, you are? If you, are, you think you are one, you make one. If you think you are two, you make two like that. Yes. It's quite uh, naive for the moment, but uh, with uh, time it's become uh, maybe more clear. And when, we, when you are finished to write this number, we, we collect the tickets and we put here. It's okay. Uh, now the on passe au suivant. Okay.
Okay, and now we distribute you um, a map, and uh, maybe it's quite uh, complicated, and uh, we explain uh, in a few, we explain uh, quickly uh, the structure, because there are structure of uh, this map. Uh, yes. Yes, you can see, I can explain here, uh, here in the map, uh, in the photocopy, it's in black, uh, you have a different uh, double. For example, you have electromagnetic uh, double, it's very important for communication. If you use internet or telephone, uh, you need uh, this kind of double. Uh, economic uh, double is also very important if you work some, uh, somewhere. And the uh, administrative uh, double is uh, if you have a citizen of a state, for example, or if you pay uh, ta some tax. Here you have a psychological double, bi biological, biologic uh, double, semiotic double, and metaphysical du double. This is very important. <coughs> For each of uh, these double, you have some number. Uh, for example, uh, uh, if you are a uh, consumer, uh, you have a specific number uh, with uh, your banking card. And also with administrative double, you have a, a social identity number. In the map, you can see also different complex because uh, uh, we are inside uh, like a big system with different uh, complex. And uh, you have also in a white some this definition of I, what, uh, what uh, you are, what uh, am I. And you have different zones for else, travel, live, speak, hear, see, eat, communicate. Alors, the point is uh, you must use um, the, color pencil. the color pencil. Maybe you have not the right color, but uh, you can, uh, maybe you can, uh, or you can use other color if you are, if you have. And uh, you must decide how you govern yourself. And uh, you must decide uh, what is the center of you, yourself. You can you show in the map, there are no center. You have many double, maybe there are no center. And maybe there are a center, or many centers. And you must uh, decide what is the center of the map, or if there are many centers. And uh, look, uh, you must, with a red uh, pencil, uh, write the different zones where you think you govern yourself. You make like a line in the the part you think you govern yourself, and other part where, uh, where, where you think uh, you are governed by others. Uh, then you have uh, three colors, one, uh, one where you govern yourself, another where you are governed by others, and the third is the center of the map. So, so, so here, so here. Mm. Yeah, so. It's uh, 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 just to, to make sure, you have to use three colors. Uh -huh. One color is uh, you draw a circle where you think are, you are in charge. You, are, you govern this, uh, yeah, you, this you're part. You're the boss yeah. over yourself. Yes. Then the other uh, color is where, where, people, where other people are the boss over you, basically. Yes. yes. And, and then the third one? The third one is the center of the map. Okay. It's the center of yourself. Okay, so where you would... Mm place your center on this map. Yes. Okay. Ah oui, mais on a fait, j'ai fait rapidement. Non, mais... vas-y, vas-y, vas-y. Tu peux continuer ici, s'il te plaît. Ah non, ça c'est un peu facile, mais j'ai expliqué la structure qu'on a fait ensemble. Je ne sais pas qu'est-ce qu'on peut rajouter. On l'a fait, on l'a fait ensemble, donc moi je l'ai fait parce qu'on avait décidé. Il y a les différentes zones, il y a les... And if you, if you don't have all the colors, you can trade with your neighbors, of course. 
If it's not clear, you can uh, ask uh, some question or for clarification and so. Yes. If you if you don't understand the the, the organization or so part, we can hmm. discuss. Are there any questions now? <laughs> so they're asking you have the, no start. Yeah. You have no start. You must decide the start. And, and is this start, would that, could that also be the, your center, where people would, uh, would start in this map? So if, if people see like a, a, a start it, it, somewhere on the paper where they think uh, their, their voice through this map starts, would that be the center of the person? Hmm? Would, would that be the, the, the center of that person? Yes, it's, uh, yes the center uh, of the person, the center uh, where, where, where you think you are. Yeah. Okay. But it's <laughs> Maybe not it's a GPS center for some, some, uh, some bodies. I think uh, I am where there are GPS uh, uh, co co coordinate. Okay, huh? okay. For, for others, it's, it could be an uh, identity uh, card. Okay. For others, it's a TCP IP. Uh, so, so it sounds like you also should actually do this quite intuitive, right? So base your center around the parts that, that, most, uh, that appeal most to you, right? Yes, but the center can also appear at the end when you have uh, make your, your own work inside this map. Hmm? You missing? I am missing missing music on this map. I am outside this map. Okay. Good. You can add if uh, there are uh, uh, space where no, not in the map. You can add. Okay. Yes. May I produce sounds? Uh, uh, there is. A, I produce sound. It's uh, in. A, I make some activities with my organs. I produce sounds. But this map is not total. We cannot uh, put all the things uh, we must do put uh, for. By, uh, by governed by others, you mean other people, or could it be uh, something else, like uh, the environment? Uh, uh, governing uh, by others, it could be um, machines. It could be uh, other human beings, it could be uh, animals or vegetables or metaphysical entities. It could be very diverse. Okay, thank you. I just sorry. I just noticed that some um, <clears throat> some ways of government are already implied by the map. Some because you say, um, for instance, there's on the map. I watch television, and television enters my private space. And the last one already implies that there is a certain amount of government. Was that your purpose or? Because if you're saying that television enters your private space, you're basically saying that it intrudes. Uh, television uh, enters in your private space. You can uh, say, uh, okay, if it's enter, it's a part of me, or it's uh, another uh, body who govern my, my, uh, my space. You, are, you can have a different approach of that. Okay. <laughs> hmm? Um, I don't know if it's, uh, oh, maybe it's needed some time to, uh. So is there any more questions in the meantime while you're thinking about your center and who's governing you?
Xavier, what was the uh, color code again? Uh, the, the, the color code? The, the, the colors that you should use for each thing? Yes, but the, the color can, sh can change. The important is that you have three colors, different okay. colors, and you can yes. make your own okay. uh, legend. Yes, and legend, uh, the color, yes. Okay, everyone should make a legend with their map as well. Yes, if it's or <laughs> orange, it's uh, for govern yourself, you make a orange and a Qu'est-ce qu'on fait on... on passe C'est pour ça que moi je pensais qu'on allait la faire ensemble. De quoi Non, non, moi je te dis carte comme ça et à lire ensemble. Et les gens répondent. Ouais, mais ça je pense qu'il aurait fallu le dire avant et dire, c'est quand on a préparé qu'il faut dire ça, il faut mettre maintenant. Maybe, maybe it would also be good if, if you yourself would fill one in and then uh, think aloud. <laughs> Ok, mais... Euh, hein? C'est comme ça. Ah, si, c'est ok. Euh, ok, uh, now... Um, We distribute uh, just a, a new small paper. And uh, the idea is, uh, uh, after this uh, exercise, uh, maybe uh, you change your, um, uh, uh, the, um, how you consider how many you are, the number you, of yourself. And uh, in the paper, write the new number you think. Maybe it's more precise and, uh, or it changed. And uh, if you think uh, maybe before you make uh, two, and now you make uh, just one or ten, and uh, uh, just put a new number. So uh, is anyone in need of, of these papers to put a new number down, or do you still have one? Uh, you distribute it? Uh, yes, uh, I try to. <laughs> But um, I don't know, are there, are there people that change their minds on uh, the number that they oh, are? I think you distribute it, yes. Oh, okay. There's some people still thinking, there's some people that have changed their mind? <laughs> no, I don't know, it's uh, just, uh, you know, if you, 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 we can compare after if they are changed or not. Yeah. It's yeah. a first experiment, we don't know exactly what is, uh, if uh, there are signs or not. Maybe it's, uh, there are no, no meaning of that. We don't know exactly. So can I collect the new numbers for everyone that has a new one? No, no, no.
More numbers? No? Ah, okay. Non, 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 je pense qu'on va maintenant. Ok. Euh, on fait une conclusion là-dessus. Uh, we don't know exactly if uh, there are a uh, conclusion. Uh, there is a conclusion for this uh, experience. Uh, for the moment, we realize map about systems like uh, world government, like that, and uh, also technical system. Uh, and we think uh, it's important to 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 return the question and to know exactly when we speak about something from where and uh, how, uh, what is our own uh, topology, our, our own uh, uh, space. And uh, we think it's uh, maybe the basis to, 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 to begin an orientation in, uh, in reality, yes. It's the reason uh, we, we propose uh, this uh, exercise. Um. Well, uh, is there, is there any more, uh, any questions to, to uh, the explanation of the exercise? Was this the end of the exercise? Yes, it's yeah. the end of the uh, experience. <laughs> okay, is there, because uh, I saw you take out some more uh, stuff, is there, is there uh, some... We have some maps if uh, yeah. people are interested, but it's not about uh, uh, ourselves or yourself, but uh, more about the system, uh, about different systems. Okay, uh, I think I think this will be really good to, to get a, uh, also a better understanding of, of what this, this practice was about. Um, uh, if you see, uh, if, you, if you see it in the context of, of the work of Barode um, too, shall we? Uh, shall we? Yes, we can just uh, do this work, but uh, yeah, during uh, uh, some times we realize map like that. Uh, here it's more about uh, cartelization and monopole in. Uh, in the world, <coughs> structure of government. Uh, we realize map about, uh, uh, yes, agro-food industries, about uh, some uh, very important uh, clubs, and uh, also about uh, internet, and, uh, and so. It's just to, to make a context of uh, this uh, new map. To Okay, is there, is there any questions concerning uh, also this map and, and this practice? Then uh, I would like to thank Bureau d'Etude for their little demonstration. And um, move on to uh, the stage right here where uh, Anna is positioned for uh, a work in progress presentation by uh, Di Mason. This will take place here. The Dai um, will briefly join me here. Um, I first would like to introduce Dai Maston. She is a fashion designer who trained at uh, fashion design at Central St. Martin's College of Art in London. Among many other things, her work was sold at Selfridge, Urban Outfitters, Harvey Nichols. And Dai collaborated uh, with XS Labs and electronic textile uh, expert Joey Berzowska. And today she will present together with uh, an interesting team uh, she brought along and with the V2 uh, lab developers, her latest work that is still in progress, uh, shareware that is being developed during her residency here at V2. So, Dai, floor is yours. Thank you very much. 
Um, first of all, we're just going to bring the models on. This is Sharon <laughs> and Manon, um, Stock and Simon. Um, first of all, um, we're going to take you through the project, the Shareware project, and just explain a bit about what it's all about, and then do a bit of a demonstration. So, um, ooh, it's noisy. Um, first of all, Shareware um, comprises of a pair of reconfigurable dresses. And share, Shareware dresses can... This isn't working very well, is the mic working? Okay. Um, they can be re reconfigured in various ways to change shape and um, kind of environment. Uh, Shareware dresses try and bring something, a piece of the home, out into the urban environment. This microphone's doing my head in. <laughs> can I, I can't take it off. It just sounds really funny. Is it too close? Yeah. Is that better? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah? Is it working? Okay. So um, the, the shareware dresses that they aim to uh, encourage people, both the wearers of the dresses and also the audience, to play and manipulate, with the, manipulate the dresses and um, have a kind of interaction. So um, first of all, uh, we're going to have a quick look about what the project's all about. And... Um, the interactive concept behind it. So here we have these pictures that are so small, none of you can see them. <laughs> but basically, they're these kind of iconic images which show you how the dresses work and um, bringing one dress to the next and joining with magnets to activate lights. And there's a series of um, different reconfigurable um, scenarios that can occur. So this is the picture. There's lots of little um, printouts of those down there that you can maybe have a look at later or come up and have a look. Um, secondly, we're going to have a look at how the, the four, four different ways that the dresses can connect and what might happen when they do connect. So the first thing we're going to do is um, take a look at this big skirt module here. So this green skirt module can slot onto Manon. I'm not going to slot on straight away. It can slot here. If um, Manon just turns around, there's a connector point just here. And the dress, the dress can slot on to do a myriad of things. But first of all, I'm just going to show you. The dress um, underneath here has a light uh, source. So it's like a, got an, a Luxion LED embedded inside of it. And you can actually manipulate that light by pulling this lever just like this. And this um, disc with uh, kind of cutouts uh, moves around so the light kind of speckles along your legs. So now we're going to try and slot this onto the dress. The first time we've done it, so wish us luck. It's a two-man job. So, Simon. Da -da -da. It's a bit nerve-wracking doing this the first time live. Jesus. Here we go. In the meantime, whoa. Oh my God. In the meantime, I have here the other dress with the other skirt, which you can tell is not quite finished yet. But um, because it's still open, you can see some of the mechanical and electrical bits and, and wires and stuff that go into one of these dresses. And this dress, like the other dress, has a light that shines out at the bottom and it can be tilted to shine close behind or a more uh, long beam behind. And Do you want me to push the lever? So yeah. this, this is it in its raw state, as Stock mentioned. And when we push this mechanical lever, the the Luxon LED twiddles underneath. It, it gets, uh, throws a long beam of light, or it can be short and disappear up your leg. So un unfortunately, this isn't functioning right now, so you'll have to use your imaginations. <laughs> so that's that. So next, um, one other element, because the dress isn't quite functioning as it should be at the moment. Um, there should be two modules on each dress, like so the pop on the side that, that physically slot together. So we'll do this down here. And when, they, when these two slot together magnetically, like, like so, lights within the dress, they should um, activate. But right now, <laughs> that's not working. So again, use your imagination. So, so next section. Um, each dress, like I said, has hidden light within it so <laughs> um, that's quite noisy <laughs> each each skirt has hidden light within it so this one has a light under here this one has a light under here but they also have these two hovering hats here that activate light as well so the hats 
should slot in like so into the dress. And they can be maneuvered by twiddling them. So you can throw light up at the ceiling and cast shadows, or throw a halo of light over yourself, or throw your friend into silhouette up, up along the wall. We have one, this is our first iteration of the hovering hat, and at the moment it's wiggling rather. <laughs> it's, um, it's a little bit unstable, so we're going to create an, a bracket to hold it in place. So for the time being, we'll ask the twins to, to support their own hovering hats, although they should support themselves, so they're supporting them. So what are we discussing next? Hovering hats. So um, uh, I'll just ask Manon and um, Sharon to swap positions. So this is interaction number two or three, I've lost track. So um, one of the ways, what <laughs> one of the ways, another one of the ways that the dresses can join together is through these two tables that pull out from underneath. So they pull out like so, so you'll need to move this way a little bit. And they slot together. And these tables, oh, it works, it works. <laughs> Wicked. <laughs> That's so exciting. <laughs> so it works, right. Um, OK, so um, the table, I'm really excited. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, OK, so the idea being that the two twins, both their lights should turn on at the moment, but this, this skirt isn't functioning, but it will do. They can then manipulate the light and throw shadows through the table to cast. The, li the light here is a bit too light, so you won't see it. But to, to throw spots through here, so you can see the shadows down here from the table. But they can also put their drinks in here. That's nice. <laughs> and they can also, I don't know if they're going to be able to do it, but why don't you stay put and let's see if you can walk. This is the first time we've ever done this. Oh, maybe not. They're supposed to be able to maneuver. OK. Because they're on hinges, so they can swing round and move into different positions, and the table moves too. But because this isn't like stuck in the right position, it's quite tricky to show you that. So ooh, just like that. So there we go. There's there's the table. So um, I think at this stage, do we take the skirt off? Was that the plan? Okay. So the next part of this interactive extravaganza is. Um, this. Ordinarily, if the dresses were sticking on properly, the two girls would squish together and their, these buttons join. And then we ask, is it, is it shining? Okay, could we turn the lights down a little bit? Or, that's it. Yay, the music's good for this. Okay, so now, um, Manon, if you walk around here, we can see. Oh, hold on, hold on. This is the first time we've done this, so bear with us. <laughs> so I can I can remove the hovering hat actually, that's a bit easier. There we go. <laughs> so that's it. Okay. Thank you. And then stuck, do you wanna explain what were we talking about next? So um hovering hats off. Okay, and then just finally, the last, the last thing. So the whole idea with this is that the dresses are made of modules and not only can the wearers kind of play with them and slot things on, but um, also the audience as well. And um, one big part of that, we've designed these kind of migrating mood modules that affect the way the light behaves. So um, if we turn the light down again, so put that on. If we remove that module and replace it with this one it changes the behavior of the light. So now it's kind of speckling. Now, yeah, just like changing, just flashing. And then a couple more. <laughs> this is music by Scanner. <laughs> so he designed the music. Okay, and then finally. So that's kind of pulsing. So there's many, many sort of playful elements to the dresses. And uh, I think we've shown you all of them. Have we shown them everything? I think that's everything. Um, 
so we'd really love it if, if you're interested for you to come and have a play and see how things click and slot together and have a go with the migrating mood modules yourself. So, um, and also just to say thank you very much to V2, everyone here. It's been really fun doing this. We're not quite finished <laughs> with the project yet, but we'll be soon. So thank you very much. Thanks. Wow. I would just uh, make a final remark to connect uh, your project also a little bit to the context of the evening. Uh, that was a hard one uh, to think about, but um, I think Shareware investigates the continuity of the topological parts that together can construct home or uh, comfort feelings. Mm -hmm. And thank you all very much for this beautiful work in progress uh, show. We now move uh, to Michel uh, again for uh, last uh, words. Michel? Well, the, the last word will actually consist of, uh, of a thank you to all the presenters. Uh, Tiziana, of course, Christoph and uh, Matthias, uh, Yolanda, of course, uh, Dai here and the people from Bureau d'Etudes. Uh, thank you all for, for your nice presentations and, and demonstrations and uh, getting the audience involved in your work. But also uh, a very big thank you to the people that uh, made this possible behind the stage, uh, the people in production, PR, and doing the streaming and, uh, and cameras. So that's Richard Wilco, Anna Mercedes, Joris, Carl and uh, Menelt, Anna on the camera, Rayo, Maarten, Piem uh, on the streaming. And of course, thanks to, uh, uh, thank you all for coming over here and, and uh, seeing the, the projects uh, that all these artists are presenting. And of course, uh, you can stay around for, uh, for another drink. And uh, now the playtime, uh, as Christoph already mentioned, uh, will start, because now you can actually start to use all these, uh, all these installations and works that have been presented. So I'd like you all to invite, uh, uh, to invite you to do so. Okay, thank you very much.